And to everybody, welcome to tonight's uh, volleyball webinar, um, free from USA Volleyball. With thanks to Eric Fuchs, tonight's presenter. Um, we'll get started because it's the holidays and we don't want to be on here too long. There's a lot to cover. So, um, Eric, I'll, we'll sort of take it your way. Um, and you just let me know okay. if you want me to change the slides, and I'll help you out, and I'll be talking some stuff, and Denise will be talking some stuff as well. The thing is on with us tonight from USA Volleyball. Um, Eric, of course, is the Director of Athletic Training and Education Programs at EKU, and he presented this great job for our Sports United Sports um, Sports United, but the uh, Department of State grant in in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, to about ten. Well, we had seven different countries plus a bunch of other coaches there. And, uh, he's willing to share this with us tonight. So, Eric, it's all yours. Okay. Well, as uh, I want to thank John and USAV for having me. But as he said, I've done this presentation at the volleyball festival and. A little bit of background of my volleyball background. I've been with the volleyball festival for now 16 plus years, um, working uh, at that festival and as the associate medical director for probably the last 10 years of that tournament. In addition to being an athletic trainer, and I have worked at the high school level, I've been a head athletic trainer at the college level, um, and now I am a program director at Eastern Kentucky University. So just to give you an idea of my background. You want to go to the next slide there? Yeah, you've got quite a, quite a little resume even in just black and white here. 16 years at the festival. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No wonder Dave so, likes having you there. <laughs> Been around with them for a while. Yeah. So, and you can see my other speaking and stuff. But we're here to talk about preventing uh, volleyball injuries. I always start off with that part because part of your role as coaches is to be able to recognize when an injury needs to be referred but as well as prevent. And a lot of that starts with proper conditioning and strength training. Um, a lot of times with strength training uh, in high school and some club setups, the players are put through the same conditioning routine and Instead of being individually assessed for where are they strong, where are they weak, what do they need to work on, I know our strength coaches here at Eastern will put each player through a core test, core strength test to see where they're at. We'll test their uh, different strength levels and then come up with an individualized uh, strengthening conditioning plan. And you also have to look at the position. Now, I know in youth and high school and club sports sometimes persons play multiple positions but still um, different positions may need some different strength training in, in different areas or improvement so we got to look at doing some of that individualized which becomes a challenge because you're going to work out as a team in practice but the conditioning and the strengthening of them you want to want that to be as individualized to their, their areas that they may have weakness. They may have a muscle imbalance in their quads and hamstring, which can put them at risk for knee injuries. They may have a weak core, um, which if they're an outside hitter, um, or if they're a uh, back row specialist, uh, can also create problems in maintaining position for passing or lead to further injuries. So core strengthening, you'll hear me mention a lot. I know it's a buzzword out there, but if they're assessed for their weaknesses and you address those muscle imbalances early on, you'll have a well-rounded person. So um, you got to look at the individual first and then look at the sport and the position and then go from there. Okay, next slide. So core strengthening, um, there's lots of different techniques and the key in core strengthening is it's the uh, quality, not necessarily the quantity of the positions. Um, those happen to be um, three of the, the basic positions where you can test people's core and see what they can do. Um, you know, whether they're able to do glute bridges. Some of your athletes may not be able to do a double leg glute bridge. They may have to start single leg. 
um, or you may find when you do a single leg on one side, they can do it on the other, they can't, showing a muscle imbalance from left to right. Lateral pillar bridging, that's at an elbow level. You can make it more complex by going to a hand level, um, and then plank. The key is the posture. If you look at that slide on the right where I have an actual person doing some of these, you want to make sure the head and the scapula and the glutes are all in line and you're maintaining that positioning. And if at any point they can't maintain that, they're losing it, then they need to stop. If they get to 10 reps and they can't maintain, it is better to stop than push through. And I know that's hard for coaches to hear sometimes, but we're trying to work that core up. The good news about a lot of core strengthening is, is you don't necessarily need equipment and weights to do it. This is one example. There's many things online as well as strength coaches can give you tons of different resources or email me and give you all kinds of resources. Swiss balls um, can also be used for a lot of different core strengthening exercises. Um, but another important thing when you're dealing with youth, um, with the club coaches and the younger uh, participants is I know it sounds cliche, but if you can get them to work on their posture, um, keeping good posture is going to help their core. This has been shown if you look at dancers and in, in the research with dancers, of course, they have good core besides their activities. But one thing that they've been emphasized since they were young as dancers is their posture. And a lot of volleyball players, um, especially young ones, sometimes are self-conscious about their height at the younger ages, and so they want to slouch which can lead to other shoulder problems as well as problems with their core. But I know that sounds subtle, but a simple thing um, to start there, especially when you're working with your younger players, is encouraging good posture. Yeah, that's okay. a great, great observation. And Will has asked, will the slide set be made available to participants? Um, what, while we could email the PowerPoint to you, what we normally do is um, we've recorded this webinar, and it's on a... Um, uh, movie maker, uh, Windows Movie Maker, so you can slide the, uh, the 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 scroll bar to any point in time and freeze it and listen and re-listen to what Eric's saying and things like that. And this will be up uh, by the end of the week to the USA Volleyball free webinar section underneath the grassroots button. So there will be a Q and A period at the end, um, but you know Will's got a good question and we'll throw it in now. So that's the answer. Okay. So we can go to the next slide there. So what does good core strength help? It can prevent some of the common injuries or lessen the severity. And one is ACL injuries. Um, ACL besides um, quad and hamstring strength, um, of course, uh, Cincinnati Sports Medicine has an ACL uh, prevention program for women that they did with soccer athletes, et cetera, but a lot of it centers around core strengthening as well as some proprioception training and things that, that's a good program to look into. But core is going to be helpful. And later we have a video to, to kind of illustrate that. Shoulder injuries as well. Again, this goes back to that posture and keeping the core straight as well as letting the core do the rotation. If you're an outside hitter and you're going up, as you're coming through and going back, hopefully you're going to have the obliques and the abdominals helping in that trunk rotation um, pull that arm through so that the scapula and the scapula thoracic area can stabilize and be a platform that's being moved through. And that trunk's going to give you more power and speed as you come through. But if you lose that cord, then the arm's having to do all the work and the scapula is sitting out there now floating and not stabilized and attached to that core very well. So it's kind of like the ship out there, the scapula is floating on water versus being attached in and being slingshot through. Low back injuries, um, you hear this over and over again, that core stability, the better the core is, um, you can prevent a lot of those. And in, we're going to talk about some low back injuries that are very common um, in volleyball players that we, ironically, at the volleyball festival, usually five to six if not more, that we pick up on um, that 
the girls have probably had these injuries all season, but nobody got it referred and, and picked up on it. But the core stabilizing can help some of them. And then ankle injuries, um, believe it or not, being able to find yourself in time and space as you come down. Now, some of those, even if you look at uh, contact with the teammate in uh, the NCAA uh, high-risk injury data surveillance, you'll see is 15.8% of injuries in competition. So some of these mechanisms we're not going to be able to completely prevent. So some of the ankle injuries can be the standalone ones because acute non-contact injuries among volleyball players in NCAA um, during competition account for 37.6% of your injuries. So based on the NCAA surveillance. So if you think about that, that means they're not running into coming down on somebody else's ankle. They're either coming down on their own side of the ankle or as in a video coming up, you'll see an ACL that's a non-contact one that occurs based on body position and probably some muscle imbalances and coordination issues. So uh, proper management and return to play decisions do impact recovery when you do have injuries. So um, putting people back too soon from certain injuries, like if somebody has an ankle injury and you want to get them back there and you want the magic of the brace or other things, just realize that if the ankle's weak, it can go up the chain to the back of the ACLs. So that's why I sort of mentioned that here. You've got to be smart with some of these injuries. But that good core hopefully will help prevent some of them. Go ahead to the next. Now, Eric, I've got a kind of, we didn't talk about this in Phoenix, but yeah. um, when I did a look at the six years of, of the injuries to the knees for USA Junior Olympic players, um, one thing kind of that, that stood out was that nearly 80% of the injuries, I think it was 76.9%, um, were to the non-dominant knee. Mm -hmm. and okay. maybe you're going to cover this, but when I do the CAP courses, I speak of something that I find rather odd in our teaching, and that is that if you play basketball, you're going to learn to dribble right and left-handed and shoot mm -hmm. and be kind of bilateral skilled, and then when you, and I coach lacrosse, my son's, you know, at, um, at Princeton, and he's pretty good lacrosse player right and left, and when you play soccer, you kick and dribble right-footed and, and left-footed. You would never not do the other foot, you know. Yet we come into yeah. volleyball, and the vast majority of coaches spend 0% training the non-dominant hand. And yeah. um, it, 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 the body position, I don't know if the videos are going to work very well yeah. online through okay. the webinar. Um, so you may have to talk, a web, <laughs> talk through what the... the the What's going on in going. it? But okay. is that something that you're going to address, or is that something to be? Well, it's 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 two part, and one I'll address right now to it is is it goes back to that earlier slide when I talked about an individual program. You have to look at when you're developing a strength program. What are there? What is strong? What is weak? And do an overall assessment and a conditioning program. There is general conditioning that you can put together as a coach, but then there should be some individualized what is weak, what is not, and that you need to be training both sides. Um, also, I would say that practicing landings and going up and approaches from either side, of course, would benefit that person. Um, and, of course, everybody would love to have somebody who could hit with both hands, but that's not realistic for every player, but it goes back to that individualized identifying strength training. Also, the STOP program by the AOSSM, which is trying to prevent overuse injuries in youth sports, um, points out that one of the advantages where most of our athletes used to in the past that were younger played multiple sports, they're specializing, like the club volleyball players playing volleyball in high school and then going in the club season and they're not necessarily playing another sport that would help balance out the other muscles as they're developing. So, so one of our one of our players from Texas asked, will players overuse muscles if they're playing high school and club? Is that too much? <laughs> and that kind of goes to what you're talking about right now. 
Yeah, and that that's the the big debate. If if you the OSSM stop program has a lot of good stuff on on overuse prevention and stuff and injuries, but potentially if you're playing both sports, it can. It depends on the intensity of the workout and how they overlap. And every club is a little bit different in their practice schedules, and every state's high school season is a little different in rules on on how those overlap or don't overlap. But yes. Um, the repetitiveness, especially in the same sport, you're using the same muscles over. So if you go from a a high school practice into a club practice, you've got fatigued muscles that are now being used over again, and so that's putting them at some risk. Well, so, I'll tell you the one that I, I mean, I I hear what you're saying about the. Uh, the not wanting to be like Sean Rosenthal, able to hit right-handed and left-handed. I, I right. wasn't really talking about that. Right now I see that we train at zero, and because we have this thing called the antenna, right. when the outside hitter, which is the primary hitter in our sport, comes right. in from the zone four on the left side of the court, jumps properly, everything's good. If they jump and the ball's a little bit more to their inside, they reach out with their right hand and they save it and they land pretty safe. But because yep. of the antenna, when the ball's pushed to the left of them and there's an antenna. It bounces back. Well, they only know how to hit it with their right. They lean remarkably to the left to attempt to bring it inside the antenna. And then they come down and boop, that's when they get hurt. So yeah, it's it's learning how to control the body in time and space, and that that I'll address, and that I was going to address a little bit with that video, depending how good it is in proprioception. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and getting to the fact where the person can control and doing some different activities, because the example I'll give you, though, the subtle example of this is, is somebody sprains their ankle, and we talk about strengthening the muscles, and most people in here have probably sprained their ankle where it inverted. Well, you can strengthen the everters, the perineals, the muscles that turn the foot out, and make them as strong as we want it. But if your body doesn't know when to fire them to prevent it from rolling under, it doesn't matter how strong they are. And that's the proprioceptive link. And that's being where your body in time and space. Yeah. I mean, gymnast divers are exceptionally good. But there's some training you could do for awareness there. Okay. With the core, you could have proprioception with the core to help. Okay. Well, Jill, um, I'm going to go to the next slide, but slide. Jill asked a question that seems to still fit the beginning of our slideshow, and that is, is it better to devote more time at younger ages to athletic development or competing? Now, I guess that's a question that really. Let's save it to the end, Jill. We'll. Uh, yeah, we'll ask that one as we get through the this this shoulder and body part stuff. <laughs> okay, so take it. <laughs> <up. laughs> All right. So overuse shoulder injuries. Again, I'm not going to try to make people on here medical experts like athletic trainers, docs, etc. But what I want you to do is, as the title slide said, be able to recognize when you need to seek out some help. There's there's three basic types of of chronic injuries that we do see with, with volleyball players, and one is biceps tendonitis, and with that there's usually going to be some pain in, in the interior of the shoulder, pain with the activity, but the key with tendonitis is, is it usually is painful initially before activity and after, but during activity it goes away, and that's because as the tendon gets warmed up and moved around, it feels better. The next is rotator cuff tendonitis, which gets a lot of press. Um, and can be brought on by overuse, it can be brought on by the muscle imbalances we've talked about. And then there's shoulder impingement syndrome. Now impingement is actually where the bone or the tendon are actually getting squeezed or pinched based on the motion. Now, one thing about this, one, it, you need to identify which it is because shoulder impingement could be a structural thing because different um, people have different where your collarbone comes across, known as your clavicle, and comes out to your ACD, it can have different levels of a hook. We call them in the medical field type 1, type 2, and type 3. And if you have a type 2 or type 3 where it's curved down, it can actually be the bone is impinging on that. And so 
you're going to be at a higher risk for problems with the shoulder. And the only way you're going to find that out is by an x-ray to, to really find out. But if you have a long-term chronic true impingement syndrome that's not all up to any other problems, then for sure it should have been followed up on and at least an x-ray to make sure you don't have a structural. And if you have a structural, then they can talk about rehab and things to fix that. The biceps tendonitis, rotator cuff tendonitis, those, if you stretch, hopefully you catch them before you you uh, get too far. Do not let pain, if you have pain in your shoulder, your player, coaches, you have athletes with pain, pain is an indicator something's wrong. Let's find out what it is, let's start treating it, and it should improve, but it's also going to need some rest. So if they're an outside hitter, they're going to need to back down the number of hits they're taking in practice. They're going to have to have some alternating rest there. It doesn't mean they still can't run, condition, move through some place, but they're going to need some downtime, which I know no coach wants to hear. But you want to heal that up because if that pain continues, it, the muscles in the rest of the shoulder are going to respond to that pain and other muscles are going to have to fire, which can lead to problems. Go on to the next slide. Will do. I think, I think it's the one that. So how do we prevent some of the overuse shoulder injuries? goes back to the first slide I talked about, good core strengthening. So the trunk is taking more of that flexion and creating the power, which is going to give the person more power as they come through a little bit and add to it and unload the, uh, the rotator cuff. Proper jump training. Um, if you look in that bottom slide, you've got one girl who's going up at an angle. And again, they're trying to get over to get the block. And I get that. The arms are over. But if they can get into position, and I know you drill this, but step over and get straight up, when those arms are straight up and they have the core to take that block into their arms or resist it versus their shoulder being off at an angle and taking it, it's going to reduce some of the stress and strain in the shoulder. And the same be going for the hit. Now, I know everybody in here would love to have perfect passes and, and uh, get the perfect set, and that's not going to happen. But learning how to go up and jump and try to keep centered, and I know you talked about keeping your shoulders square, which is another important part of that. Good leg strength is going to help that. Um, proper hitting technique, which I know is drilled, but reduce repetition. In other words, hitting and hitting and hitting to have hitting practice. If it's not quality hitting, stop. Because all un, you know, poor technique is going to do is aggravate the shoulder or an injury. So get them to hit properly and maybe reduce some of the hitting, especially if they're recovering from an injury or having some shoulder pain. Next slide. All right. Unless you got a question. So, Stretching, of course, um, the biggest thing here, and I, maybe this will be new to some of you in the volleyball world or uh, maybe not, but the biggest thing that I have on here is, is focusing on posterior shoulder capsule. I mean, I see a lot of volleyball players. They're all stretching out the front of their arms and, and coaches and, and others. But baseball has learned this years ago, and if you look in the baseball research and you look in most of the current shoulder research, the posterior capsule is what's tight and restricted. In volleyball, your, your anterior capsule is, is wide open. You're using it all the time. It's well stretched. We've got to loosen up the posterior to allow for some flexibility back there and less compression in the back. So it's an area of stretching that often uh, goes unstretched because everybody's worrying, worrying about the front. Uh, again, low weight, high rep because in the weight room, when you're thinking about strengthening the shoulder and the shoulder areas for the players, the ball is not that heavy, and we need to train for fatigue because if you get to that fifth game, that arm's tired. So we need to get the endurance up in the, in the muscles and the muscle fibers themselves to withstand the repetition there. So don't forget about the fatigue factor, even though it's people think of it as short games, it still can go five matches. And a lot of you in club, like at the volleyball festival, are playing so many games back to back to back that that fatigue factor is 
is a problem. In the high school season, you might have one or two games a week and you have rest period in between. But in a club tournament on a weekend, you guys all know you can have a lot of games. So don't forget about training some of the uh, high reps to with a low weight to get the fatigue. Um, scapula thoracic exercises. Um, and I don't know that I have pictures on the next slide of this or not, but this is the area that needs to be worked a lot, which is protraction and retraction, which is pulling or squeezing your shoulder blades together, um, rolling them back out, pulling them back together, elevating your shoulders, depressing your shoulders. Exercises in, in those areas need to be worked. Next slide. Now, couple of injuries I want to talk about, and one of them is, is something that we pick up on a lot of these at, at the volleyball festival, and, and I saw this a lot in my career. The first one on there is labral tears. And what you have to understand about the labrum, and the reason why I have these, these diagrams up there, is in the uh, upper right where it says glenoid labrum and it's uh, yellow shape. You've always been told, think of your humerus, the, the shoulder bone, into your, into your uh, shoulder as a golf ball sitting on a golf tee. Probably everybody's heard that. And right on the edge of the golf tee is this little lip, and that's your labrum. Okay? And it sits right around there. But it's very, very shallow. Now, if you're... If your humeral head is not held in there tightly, in other words, all the muscles aren't stabilizing and it slips around, it starts pinching that. And that labrum is beveled and it can be torn. Now another important thing, in that bottom slide it shows the tendons, and I'm not going to get all anatomical here, but there are a couple of tendons, one of them being long head of the biceps and a couple of the other tendons that actually insert and attach on that labrum as part of that labrum. So a long-term chronic tendonitis um, or pain in the, uh, in the shoulder area here can actually be a labral tear. And there's an MRI on the right with an arrow pointed to where you can see a separation of, of the structure. And the reason I bring up labral tears is this. If you have as a coach a player, this is labral tears happen acutely and then they're latent, meaning it's picked up on later and it's often missed unless the clinician really uh, looks at it and knows what's going on. Usual progression is they're diagnosed or they go and see the family doc, they tell them they have shoulder tendonitis and oftentimes because they're a young athlete, and I've actually seen this, um, the orthopedic surgeon and the doctor say, well, there's no way you can have a rotator cuff injury or labral tear. You're just too young. You're not working it that hard. Um, so it gets tendonitis. And here's the thing. When you go to rehab for a labral tear and you do the exercises and rest for tendonitis, it will feel better. But as soon as they go back to play, they'll immediately have pain in their shoulder. Oftentimes, a telltale sign besides pain in the front, they have this pain in the posterior aspect of their shoulder. But it is not to the point where it's going to prevent them from playing or performing until they continue to do that. And as the tear gets worse and the area stays uh, unstable because that structure has been, eventually they'll start losing power and the inability to lift their arm. And by then it becomes obvious, oh, you've got a major injury. But early on, and we see this in softball players and baseball players, as, and the injury happens subtly. It's, they, it's usually an outfielder goes out, picks up a fly ball, throws it hard home and says, you know what, my shoulder hurt right after I threw it, hurt back there, I put some ice on it, the next day felt fine, they continued playing on it, and lo and behold, there's a long-term labral tear there. So that is... That is one that will sneak up on you. Shoulder dislocations, I bring this up. We usually see about two or three a year. Um, those are obviously when you see them, they're going to be out of place. Um, they're medical emergency, uh, unless you have trained medical people there. Most of them are. But they're relatively rare. 
Um, but when we do see them, it's usually from digging, diving, or loose balls. So the big one is the labral tears that I wanted to let you know because it sneaks up. It is something that's going to need to get fixed, and it's often missed. Go ahead. And what's the easiest way to find that, Eric? I mean, is it is it the uh, MRI is that it's going to take to find it? Otherwise, yeah. I mean, the you can't just start MRIing every shoulder. And and, uh, and recently, there's a study done of if you MRI a shoulder, you can find a reason to have surgery. By uh, but at the same time, yeah, an MRI is going to pick up on it. What the clinical symptoms are is pain in the shoulder starting that they can play on, but it'll progressively get worse. And a lot of people will think it sometimes as a rotator cuff tendonitis, except they usually the two things that our players, even in EKU when they've been diagnosed with it, will complain is they're losing power on the ball. There's, they start to notice that first, and then eventually it gets to the point where they can't lift it. But clinically, it's that posterior pain and diagnosing it is a is a good clinical exam. Okay. Um, it can be diagnosed without an MRI, but if you suspect it, then the MRI needs to be done. Now, here's the last thing on the MRI. It should be an MRI with contrast. Any shoulder specialist will tell you uh, an MRI with contrast or CT with contrast will pick up on it. Okay. Um, right? Yeah, I'm going to... Um we're going to the next slide, but yeah. <clears throat> uh, we've got a question before we get into okay. injuries, which is a good one from Libby. You know, just what sort of age do you begin to do some sort of strength conditioning, strength training program for the players? Is there, do you have, is that a slide that's covered later, or do we, can we talk about it now? We can talk about it now. I don't think I had that in this um, slide. Okay. And, and in this presentation, but it, it's it's a good question, and and that becomes the 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 first question becomes what kind of training are you are you talking about? If you're talking about with weights and stuff, again, it should be individualized. It should start light and work up. I'm not one of those people who believes that there's a specific age where it's more appropriate than another, um, as long as it's being done right, which is looking at the individual where are they at. Has somebody assessed and looked at your core, your current strength capabilities and done, which through basic testing that strength coaches or a even a personal fitness trainer can do, can give a guide to start working towards what are your goals. Um, you know, but if they're going to be playing competitively, you know, what age are they starting competitively? And then you let them play. You know, if, if we're talking down at 9 or 10, let them play. But ideally, the best way to train is to cross-train. And that gets back to, you know, if, if they're doing some other sport or some other activity, that's going to help developing them. But, you know, as they start hitting that late junior high, middle junior high, they can start doing some of the core strength and they, they can work on posture, they can do the non-weight weight type stuff, um, and you can move into the weights. The key with any of this is, is and I, I know it sounds cliche, but having the right people in the right program progressing them. Um, that's probably the biggest emphasis. Training can be done, and it is done right if it's being supervised and followed. All right, thanks. Let's go to low um, back stuff. Okay. And to, to everybody listening yeah, in, low back. Eric, just uh, let me let me let everybody know. Um, go ahead. Yep. Just, you can ask questions in the question box, and I'll either jump them in now or later at the Q and A period at the end. Um, and there is a question panel on your your little uh, screen that you can open up and type a question in. So. Uh, whether you want to do it now when it jumps to your mind or you want to save it till later, we'll, uh, we'll be covering those later most of all. All right. Okay. So low back injuries. The reason I, I put this in because part of it is is knowing when to refer um, or check it out. Um, 
and low back injuries is probably as much as shoulders get a lot of press about being hurt and stuff. One of the biggest areas that we see, especially with youth volleyball at the volleyball festival, and we picked up on tons of these, are some low back injuries. Um, low back pain, if somebody's complaining they have low back pain or that it's tight, you got to get it evaluated. A lot of times, coaches or players will say, well, my back hurts. Well, you just got done playing how many matches in a, in a club tournament, so everybody says it's tight. And so you ice it and you stretch it out, and none of those things are wrong. But if that pain persists, and if you're having to take medication and icing and somebody's massaging it and it's persisting day in, day out, it needs to get evaluated. Um, and there's, there's a couple of other things. Obviously, if the pain causes any um, tingling or numbness down the legs of any kind or shooting pain or your legs are weak or giving out, then that, that usually gets people to come and see a healthcare provider. And that's probably when we're dealing with a nerve problem, a disc problem, a, a herniation of some type. But the, the one problem that will sneak up on you and is seen and is a common injury in volleyball, in gymnastics, you'll see it in cheerleaders, hence gymnastics, and divers is the spondylolisthesis or spondylolylosis. And it's often missed. And this is a player that's had constant <laughs> chronic back pain. Um, and they ice it and they stretch it and it sort of alleviates and goes away, but then it comes back. And when they're playing, it, it hurts. Um, if they're preseason conditioning and running, it may not hurt, but as soon as they start getting into volleyball-specific activities, it'll start bothering them and hurting. Uh, it's very common in the setter and the outside hitters. And most of the time, everybody says, your back's just tight or one side's tight, and that's, that's all it is. Or they... The other one, of course, is a muscle strain. And it could be that, but spondies, which the next slide I think is going to have some pictures here of them, part of the reason why these need to get checked is, is sometimes you can have these congenitally, and the activity is actually creating an aggravation. Can you go to that next slide? Sure. Because I think, okay. And these are big, long medical names, but... Uh, sometimes, some of you may have heard the term Scotty dog fracture um, is another common term. And there are two types. One, in that middle section of your screen, you see a vertebrae. And you see a little crack going through uh, part of the vertebrae there. And the arrows are pointing at it. And that's the, the collar of the, of the dog. Um, and that's where it gets its name, Scotty dog fracture. But this is a stress fracture. Um, oftentimes early on. And here's the thing. You can be congenitally born with this, and it's usually somewhere in the lumbar region around L4, L5. It has been seen in L3. But in outside hitters and setters and in any sport, I mentioned gymnastics, cheerleading, and the others, where you're doing a lot of extension, okay, that extension, if you don't have good core strength, the, the lower lumbar bones are basically the spinous process are hitting each other and it creates a stress reaction right on there. And as a result, you get this stress fracture. And the problem is, at the stress fracture stage, there's pain in the low back, the muscle does spasm because the muscle is trying to splint the area. And oftentimes, in a younger person, it's thought of they just have back spasms or a, uh, a strain. Um, if, they, if they're a setter, if they're an outside hitter, and the regular treatment for that has not improved it, they need to go and get it looked at. And when it's in this stage as a stress fracture, the, the scary thing for the coaches and the parents is, is a regular x-ray is not going to show it, um, usually CT or MRI. Now, the x-rays that you do see, um, one has a red line and an arrow, and it shows the L4 vertebrae slipping over. And the other one shows the L5 has slipped in. This is when spondylolysis becomes spondylolithesis, which is what we want to catch it before that. 
because what's happened here is the fracture has become complete and now the vertebrae is actually slipped in. Usually when that happens, the pain gets more intense and they're going to start having some nerve symptoms and things along those lines. But the good news is, is if it's caught early, this is something that a rehab program conditioning and rest um, can actually fix and heal. But oftentimes these volleyball players, because their backs hurt a lot, they're out there practicing, uh, but if they're a setter outside a hitter especially, and they're having these low back pain, spasm that's not being alleviated with regular, they need to get referred. And I'm telling you, at the volleyball festival, I know we've picked up on anywhere from 10 to 12 uh, cases a year. And since we have on-site physicians and orthopedists and imaging, we'll get images and we find them. So, and these are people who have played all season with these back spasms or low back pain in those positions, and lo and behold, this is what they have. So we've so, got like around 700 teams, so 7,000 athletes, and you're seeing 10 to 12 of those at the end of the season. That's a that, pretty number, it seems. That were, and that were not previously diagnosed, were just being treated as back spasms. Right. Wow. So, Fascinating. All right, next so, slide. So anytime there's pain, muscle spasm, and it's not getting alleviated, for sure, see it. Now, discs, herniations of, of the disc, um, because of the compressing uh, in volleyball outside hitters, especially because they're twisting to one side, um, you can see this sometimes in your setters as well. Again, it's that extension into that disc where you're going to have a bulging out of the disc from repetitive compression. And when they're young, that nucleus in the middle of pulposa, think of your disc as a jelly donut, especially when they're young. So that fluid in the middle will move around and as you compress and extend your spine, and if you don't have good core strength along the paraspinal muscles in the back and the abs especially, to keep these in an even state as they bend, they'll sometimes slip and bend and press the disc, which sends a bulge out. Now this one's going to be easy. Most people are going to recognize this. The players are going to complain of uh, numbness, tingling down their leg, or paint shooting down their leg. Uh, I've only had one of these where I don't think it was that obvious, and it was a person who their only symptom was when she was walking her knee gateway, and so we did a full knee evaluation, and everything was fine on the knee, so we go up the chain, and it turned out she had a disc problem. But most of the time, these are going to be pretty obvious. But again, they're not that uncommon, um, especially with the amount of play that's going on. Okay, next slide. It shows an MRI here of an actual um, bulging disc um, there. Go ahead, click the next slide. So ligamentous injuries, uh, again, you have ACL. Um, which, of course, everybody knows about. It's the middle ligament in the knee. You also have the posterior cruciate ligament, which doesn't get a lot of press, but we've seen at least one or two of these a year, I think, at the volleyball festival. Um, and the posterior cruciate ligament, or PCL, is usually injured. It's going to be a back row person or somebody going for a free ball where they're diving and landing. They land straight up to try to get it, and they land straight down on their knees, and they actually drive the tibia backwards up towards the hamstring. The front of the tibia goes backwards, and that's the motion it protects. Now, you want to try to show this video since we were talking about core strengthening and, and non-contact injuries and stuff. This is going to be an ACL. Um, maybe it'll play, maybe it won't. Yeah, that's why well, it's going to run. Okay. Well, if you've been able to see this, when the girl goes up to hit, the ball is set slightly behind her, a little bit of what you're talking about at the net action. And when she goes to grab that ball and throw over, as she comes down, you'll see her foot hit. And maybe you can send the video and you can upload it as a separate video. But when it does her whole body is off balance and she can't get herself back into and so the knee just shifts left to right as she's trying to get her body in, in line. 
and jump training and proprioception with some core strengthening can reduce that landing and, and prevention of it. It's more impressive when you see it, but go ahead. I bet in a kind of a uh, way. Yeah, well, <laughs> nobody likes to see it, but it shows, I mean, the NCAA data statistics that 37.6% of injuries during competition are acute non-contact, and that's an example. Yeah, um, and a lot of the ACLs are non-contact. To those of you uh, that might want to get this, uh, I think I emailed it to you tonight just as a follow-up, but or is that the, no, that was the preseason one that I sent yeah, you. But you yeah. If, if you get but that. It's the same, it's the same type of data. Okay. So. Um, can they get this from you, or do you want to send it to me, and I can send it out to the whole group? Uh, um, yeah, I can. I can pull it off. The, yeah. All right. I just had. I just had it up, looking at it, but I can. Pull yeah, it, pull that it would off be good. I think that's out. just some facts that make us all a little bit more accurate when we talk about things. Yeah. All right. Thanks. And then. Meniscal injuries in the knee, this is another common thing we do see. And the thing with meniscal injuries is is a lot of people play on them and play through them um, and don't realize they have it until the tear gets worse. It's usually a compressive twisting force. Um, it can be contact or non-contact. This is also likely to occur when there's no ligamentous injury, but somebody, like you were mentioning, the outside hitter going up, the ball's off. They go towards the antenna, they shift, and they land. As they land, because their body's shifting, they create a compression and a rotation down there on that knee. And as think of it this way, if you put your fist straight down into a table that had vinyl covering on it and you twist, that vinyl, if you twist hard enough, your skin will attach to it and you can tear the vinyl. And that's basically what's happening to this meniscus. If you look in the diagram on the right, the black, black one, think of the meniscus like a peach slice. It's thick on the outside and it's thin on, on the inside. And as you compress into that and tear, you can see at the bottom I've shown several different types of tears um, with a bucket handle being on the top far right and the big large flap um, in the bottom right, the two worst. But a lot of times what happens, what we see is, is a latent meniscal tear. Now, if you have athletes that are multi-sport too, somebody coming um, you know, from playing other sports in the summer, softball or, or other things, um, they could have torn it then uh, and they can have a small tear in there. And here's what's going to happen. The knee is going to hurt and swell up initially after the injury when it's a small tear. And they'll ice it, and maybe the next day or ever the few days of doing some strengthening and icing, the swelling goes down, the knee looks fine. They can run, they can jump, they're happy. Um, and then they'll be doing something. It could be four weeks later, it could be a month later, and all of a sudden they'll feel a click or they'll land wrong and they'll swell up again and it'll be sore for several days, they'll ice it, and they'll do some exercises, and they'll go down. And what's happening is when you tear that meniscus a little bit, a small part of it is flipping up in the joint. And when it flips up in the joint, it irritates the joint. But then when you move in a certain way, it lays back down, and it kind of basically seals itself back into the appropriate position, and then it's no longer irritating to the joint, and the joint's happy. And this can go on. <laughs> on and on, and it's called a latent tear. And also, for some of you, when you hear about NFL or big-time college players, oftentimes in football you hear that he has a meniscal tear, but they're getting him through playing through the season. And, and we do that a lot because it's a small tear, and if the rehab's laid it down, we'll wait until the end of the season as long as it doesn't become problematic. But that's under medical direction and, and medical guidance and control. So... If somebody has these symptoms, ironically, I treated a, we had a, a student at EKU who was in a uh, classroom whose knee locked up on her, and the person came and got me because it was in our building, and the, the student said, well, my knee just does this sometimes, and if you rub it and massage it and pull, it'll click really loud and it'll unlock, and then I'm fine. And this had been going on for this girl for over a year and a half, and she had been 
multi-sport athlete in high school wasn't playing any sports here. I'm like, well, you have a seriously torn meniscus, and she did. She had a bucket handle tear, and uh, her knee was completely locked into that position, and it took the orthopedist almost two hours to get it unlocked, and then she had surgery a day later. But this person had been living with this clicking and locking periodically for almost a year, not realizing, hey, there's something wrong. So their little point tender on the joint line, it swells. The swelling will usually go down. It'll feel better. But it's that clicking and catching that they're going to complain of. And usually when that occurs, there's some swelling and pain afterwards. OK, move on. So chronic knee injuries, however, the talk about, because um, patellar tendonitis, um, probably one of the biggest um, ones out there. Uh, overtraining uh, and or too much. If you're doing weight training and you're doing a lot of, of uh, floor activity, and the example I give is when, as was asked earlier, when you're playing high school season and club season and doing weight training on quad strength, you know, what kind of rest cycle are you getting in there? Everybody has forgotten that if you look at any strength and conditioning textbook, anybody who's talked about strength training, there is this one part of that cycle called rest. And our athletes today are not getting rest in their different cycles because they're continuously playing or conditioning. So poor mechanics or techniques can also lead to this. Again, making sure you're warmed up, stretched um, properly. And then there's also potentially just biomechanical issues, which is you're born this way. Women have a larger Q angle, which, can, which is going to affect the way the quads pull over the, uh, the patella. And so we work on core and some other things to fix that. Next. Now, one of the ones that I do want you as coaches and players and, and others to be aware of to, that get sometimes initially misdiagnosed as patellar tendonitis and are a little more significant and you need to pay attention to, one is called Osgood Slaughter's disease. And I know when I tell the athletes at the festival that some of the young ones think they're going to die. Because in medicine, we've got to give things big names. But if you look at that area, you see that bump. And what has happened is where the patellar tendon inserts into the tibia at the apophysis, this happens um, from people when they're training when they're young, um, doing a lot of quad work, et cetera. And it doesn't have to come from weight training. Um, and what happens is, is the, uh, the tendon will actually pull away from the apophysis a little and tear from the bone a little bit, and it starts filling in. So somebody who has quote unquote patellar tendonitis, but if they're point tender down over the tip of the bone, um, in that where the tendon inserts down into the bone, if they're really sore over there, that needs to be followed up and looked at. Um, they'll do an x-ray. There's not a lot. The good news is, is it's not going to be debilitating, but the problem is, is it's very, very painful anytime you touch that bump or hit it, especially while it's active. And think about volleyball and landing on your knees. Um, so you're going to have to, and we've done some creative padding with some, some uh, orthoplast and other things to protect this if the person has it. And I personally have a nice large Osgood sliders from playing hockey and football. Mainly hockey is what I got it from, from skating in, in a bad position. But you see that. Now, it should be monitored because you don't want that to evolve off, but it's going to be painful and sore, but ice, treat, and go. Um, the other one is called Larson's Johansson's disease, which there's an x-ray of it on the, on the right there. And this sometimes is referred to as jumper's knee. It's the exact same thing that's going on in Osgood Slaughter's, except that the inferior pole of the the patella or your kneecap. So at the very end of your kneecap is where the tendon in inserts, part of the patella tendon is passing through there and it's pulling a little sliver of the apophysis or the bone there um, off of it. 
and as that separates. So these people, again, supposedly have patellar tendonitis, but in reality, they're point tender, usually more tender right at the tip of the, of the uh, patella there versus on the tendon itself. So if you find somebody who's tender in those two regions and it's ongoing and it's really sore there, um, they should get referred to get that looked at just to make sure what's going on. Now, the last one down here, which happens a lot, and I've seen it a lot in volleyball and, and others now, granted this is, is, is a large exaggerated one, but it's something called patellar bursitis or prepatellar bursitis. You have these little fluid filled sacs around your knee that when you land on them, and a lot of people may have seen this with an elbow, um, they land on the hardwood when they're digging or diving on your elbow too and you hit it and then it just balloons up in this big waterly balloon swelling there. And that looks like a really bad knee um, to a lot of people but that maybe with an untrained eye, people are worried about ACL, etc. But when we see that, we know that we're dealing with just a bursa. Now, we need to get the swelling under control and get the stiffness and stuff out of there, but that's going to be treatable. The best way to prevent that injury is to be wearing your knee pads. And knee pads that are, this is my big emphasis on knee pads, that are actually functional and effective, which means how many, how, are you using the same knee pads from last season and the same ones you're using for your high school season as well as your club season? I mean, that padding does wear down over time. And I know some people don't like to wear knee pads. Um, Coaches have different philosophies on that, but if somebody has osgood slaughters, they're going to need knee pad plus a specialization or Larson Johansson and the other is the reason to wear knee pads, but I know that's a debate in the volleyball world. <laughs> so, go ahead to the next slide. I'll tell you what, um, you know, I love the knee pad thing. Um, okay. We've got a question about, from again, from Texas, does... Uh, the playing surface have any larger percentage injury rate, wood or sport court, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. That would be an interesting um, study maybe to conduct um, because I know at the volleyball festival we do use sport court, but um, there are several variables there too. Is the sport court being laid down over padding and then, then over concrete? Is it being laid down over would, um, but I haven't seen any studies. Okay. I'll have to go and look that up. That's an right. interesting question, though. Yeah, all right. Ankle injuries. <laughs> uh, ankle injuries occur all the time in volleyball. Um, lateral ankle sprain. Um, the, the biggest thing that you can do besides strengthening your ankles part that's usually missed is a lot of balance and proprioception uh, training. So we use BOCI balls for this. We use just in single leg balance with your knee bent because, again, my analogy earlier, I can strengthen the muscles that will turn the ankle out as get them as strong as I want with all the reps and exercises with tubing, with weights, with whatever I want to do. Um, walking in sand, make them strong. But if those muscles don't know when to recognize that the ankle's going into the wrong position and to fire, that's proprioception. That is your body's ability to know where the joint is in time and space through these proprioceptors. So you have to physically do balance things. I mean, when we're doing rehab in clinics, we might have somebody standing on a uh, mini tramp and passing a ball back and forth to us. Uh, we may have been doing single leg on the mini tramp, single leg on a bosey ball, and then doing other things to distract them so their body starts to get their, their ankle back into that um, proprioceptive state where it can balance. And there's been studies on force platforms, but also with people with ACLs, um, post ACL surgery and stuff that think they're 100%, but when you put them on a on a force platform where you can actually measure that sway and see what's going on. Sometimes they're not putting their weight on it um, or they're not able to correct it as quickly. So that proprioceptive training is, is important. Proper jumping techniques, again, working on that quality versus quantity 
jumping up and landing properly and sticking the landing correctly and training that so that that's what they get used to getting into is, is important in helping prevent some of these lateral ankle sprains. Now some of them are just going to happen. When you come down on the other person's foot or somebody comes under the net, we're not going to prevent them. Uh, the syndesmotic ankle sprain, which we call medically, but everybody uh, out in the lay world knows is a high ankle sprain. This is a serious injury and it takes a lot longer to heal. Now, I'll give you a simple, basic way, very basic rule of thumb to, if you wonder if your athlete suffered from a lateral ankle sprain versus a high ankle sprain. Consistently, in about 75-80% of the high ankle sprains, if a person does this, when they go to walk off, if they're your tough player, they get up anyways, and they go to walk off, they will do what we call toe walking. They're not going to put the heel of that foot down. They're going to keep the toe up and they're going to walk with their other foot and their toe. Most people, when you have a lateral ankle sprain, will flat foot walk. Think about it when any of you have ever sprained your ankle. You walk around limping on the heel of your foot. You don't dorsiflex or plantar flex, but it's stable. A syndesmotic ankle sprain, because of what's injured, and I think the next slide I'll, I'll be able to show you the ligaments, is is unstable, if you put your heel down, you actually exacerbate the injury and cause more pain. So they tend to keep their foot up, almost like they're wearing a high heel on one foot and walking with the other. So if you see that, or they tend to be wanting to do that, they need to get that looked at. It's not just your typical ankle sprain. It's, it's a pretty good gauge, but again, um, go to the next slide. Well, since we're since we're on the uh, prevention page, sort of. Yeah. I've now had three questions come in about um, active ankles. Uh, one guy, active ankles versus lace yeah. um, Active ankles. Versus. Ankle. Okay. You know. So can you yeah. fire away on that? <laughs> I can. Um, it, it's ironic. Volleyball players and soccer players are probably the few athletes that like active ankles the best over lace-ups over um, some of the other um, bracing systems out there. And the reason is, is because in both your sports you want to have the high mobility of the ankle to plantar flex your foot to help in jumping and, and help with motion. So the cautionary tale I have of active ankles is, because of that, while they will protect your ankle, they can predispose you to, if you do come down because your foot can plantar flex and you start to laterally roll your ankle, the active ankle will protect your ankle. However, if that foot gets locked, you are going to experience something called a midfoot sprain, which is a sprain of a big long ligament called the cuneal nick. Uh, neocunea navicular ligament um, that is going to get sprained. And that midfoot sprain is a significant injury that's going to take a lot longer to heal than a ankle sprain. And you're not going to be able to come back as quick because your foot, when the midfoot gets sprained, your foot, when you bear weight, spreads out. And so it becomes a you end up being non-weight bearing for a lot longer to allow that to heal. So it does protect the ankle. That's my cautionary tale of it. But at EKU, our athletes have worn both. Um, I've been in high schools. I'm not going to tell somebody no if that's what they like and want to wear. Um, but be aware that you could set yourself up for a little bit of a midfoot sprain if it happens. Um, but there's a lot of different um, ankle braces out on the market now. I do believe in ankle bracing um, or taping, either one, uh, for prevention. So I'm not going to say one is better than the other because there's, there's not the data really to support that. But that's my own intake from but seeing the active ankles is seeing some midfoot sprain. So on the... Uh, the ankle injuries itself, you can see the inversion occurs, which happens a lot in volleyball. You see tons of ankles, obviously, at the volleyball festival. 
and when that happens, you sprain the ligaments. Now, you can create fractures. Um, you, you, a lot of lateral ankle sprains, though, with the numbers we see, and a lot of people want to rush off and get x-rays uh, with every ankle that swells up just about. And most of the time, the x-rays are going to be negative, um, but you, we have something called the auto ankle rules that we follow clinicians do. If you're not sure, go ahead and get an x-ray, but oftentimes it's not going to be um, broken. You're going to have the ligaments on the outside that have been sprained, creates a lot of swelling and a lot of pain. The syndesmotic sprain, um, or high ankle sprain, if you look in that middle, and I've got an x-ray there, if you look at the x-ray of the two, there's the one with the screw and the one without the screw. The one without that screw going through that, if you come down, the big bone on the left is the tibia and the little bone is the fibula. And right where those two are side by side, right above the, the talus, there's a space there. Okay? And there's a ligament called the, the tibia fibular ligament that goes right across the front there. If that ligament gets ruptured, it opens that space. And you'll notice when they've gone in and surgically fixed this and put a screw, how close those are supposed to be together. They're supposed to be nice and tight and close. When this ligament ruptures or tears, then the space starts getting wider. Now, the wider that gap is, the more serious the injury. Because if the ligament on the front and there's an anterior tibia fibula and a posterior tibia fibula, both those rupture, then the the next thing between your tibia and your fibula is something called the interosseous membrane, which is holding these two together. And it'll start to tear up that. And that separates. So this is why the person toe walks, because that talus, which is the bone bonding up against the tibia there, is sitting right on top of your heel, which is the calcaneus. And if you put weight straight down on your heel, that pushes it straight up to the talus, and if this ligament is stretched or ripped, all you're doing is driving a wedge and opening that hole, and that's why it hurts. So they tend to walk on their toes, so they don't do that. And this becomes a significant instability, and that's why it potentially needs surgery um, if it's severe enough. And then the rare injury is the eversion, which is on the right. We don't see a ton of those. Um, but if they do occur, because the deltoid ligament is very, very strong on the medial side that holds that medial side together, but if you do do an eversion sprain, um, you're looking at a lot, lot longer time of healing than an inversion, but still not as bad as a syndesmotic. So, and they're not that common in volleyball, per se. Go ahead to the next. Managing them, an ankle sprain, of course, Everybody knows to use rice, which is rest ice, compression, elevation. And I'm telling you, the sooner you can get ice and compression and get it elevated, the better off you are on it. And we have all kinds of fancy game readies to everything, uh, crowd caps, all kinds of things. But ice and the compression wrap and getting it elevated will do you a lot of good early on for those first degree. And a first degree sprain, probably going to be able to bear weight fairly early, but usually like to get my philosophy and, and most is, is to let it rest even at the festival oftentimes the, the person can walk on them and be like look it's fresh it's acute we want to get you potentially back by the end of the week if it's a first degree so I want you to use the crutches or wear the boot for this day I have to make the deal with the athlete because none of you guys those of your athletes know you just want to play but the rest part of that and the immobilization actually gets the swelling down to allow us to make progress. That second degree strain, rice, they're going to need NSAIDs, which is your ibuprofen. But an, an important thing with injuries today, with acute injuries, for the first 24 to 48 hours of an ankle sprain, we're going to be giving somebody usually Tylenol, we're not going to give them an NSAID. It's about 48 hours after that you actually want to start the NSAIDs. Um, 
because the NSAID is going to thin the blood out and you don't want to contribute to that to that inflammation. You want to control their pain, you want to reduce it. So that's often why a lot of you who have maybe gone to an emergency room or somebody will give you some type of pain med initially and then say start taking the NSAIDs once you get it filled. And it's actually from a medication standpoint the way it should go. Second degree, they definitely should be in some type of either cam walker, which is the boot, or an air cast. They should be referred to somebody to make sure there's no more significant injury, um, small avulsion fractures. Um, third degree, which is complete rupturing of the lateral ligaments, is a significant injury. It needs to be splinted, needs to be referred to an orthopedist um, for follow-up. But those first degree ones, manageable. Go ahead now, to the next. Harry, Jill yeah. asks, do you recommend polymam green wraps for first response treatment to ankle injuries? Poly what? Polymem green wraps. P O L Y capital M E M green wraps. That's the first I've seen that. I've never heard of them, so I can't comment. <laughs> okay. Good or bad per se. What I recommend initially is ice and compression. I mean, the, it literally is the best. Now, let me say one other thing about icing an acute injury, real quick. Um, when you ice an acute injury, uh, you, you need to get the re real ice, not any chemical cold pack, not anything like that. You should be icing for anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes with ice and compression and elevation on that acute injury. It's one of the most effective things out there, and that is what is supported in the research. Now, a lot of people get worried about icing for longer than 20 minutes, which you can do as long as you're using real ice. Um, don't do it with the chemical pack or whatever that green thing is. Again, I'm not knocking that. I just haven't heard of it, and I'll have to go look that one up. Um, other ankle injuries um, to, to be worried about are stress fractures um, or lower, lower leg injuries. Um, and the stress fractures that we see in volleyball players, a um, couple of places uh, that will usually run into them, and they're usually due to overtraining, poor jumping technique, or because we're dealing with female athletes, the female athletic triad, which is uh, how are they eating, uh, what's their uh, menarche cycle, um, and, you know, all of those issues that, that go into it. Um, but if we we look one place, the first one on here, the first x-ray, there's a, I have a circle around the fibula. Um, that blue circle lets you know, and you may be able to see a very faint white line um, where there was a stress fracture. The biggest thing that I want you guys to take away from yours is if somebody says you have a stress fracture on x-ray, um, and if you look on the foot x-ray, um, you'll see where the white circle is, there's a uh, half moon shaped out from the metatarsal, which is the calcification around where there was a stress fracture. A st seeing a stress fracture on the x-ray usually means that's a stress fracture that is healed or is in the process of healing because you can see calcification. They do not show up on x-ray until after they're healing. The middle slide that I have in front of you is something called a bone scan. And when you look, this happens to be of a femur, but I, I just wanted to make this point. When you look at left to right, you see a very dark black spot on that one femur. That is the stress fracture. Stress fractures show up on bone scans early on. They don't show up on x-rays. Um, so if somebody suspects that you have a stress fracture, Hopefully, you're seeking out and getting a bone scan done to, to find it. Now, um, stress fractures in volleyball players, where do we usually see them? We see them in the tibial region, from, usually in preseason, and actually this marked fracture, um, stress fracture, which is what this foot one is called because it's on the second metatarsal, we actually see um, as well from repetitive jumping, it's called a march fracture because it's seen a lot in the, in the military from marching a lot. 
as well. So, but again, stress fractures can occur also in the femur. They can occur in the neck and the femur, places along those lines. But again, go on to the next slide. Will do. And I've been looking up at the polymem green wraps, and they would certainly apply to your uh, compression part because they're kind of like a thinner, tighter wrap than an ace bandage and stuff. Okay. So, looks like they would do the trick. All right. Now, we'll talk about some common foot injuries. Um, and I put this slide in there to give you guys a little orientation and point out that there's a lot of bones in your foot. Um, and Will there be a test? <laughs> no, there will not. Not for you guys. <laughs> so... There's all these little bones that are running around in your foot, from your metatarsals to um, your tarsal bones, which is your navicular, cuneiform, the talus, um, the calcaneus. Um, but the fifth metatarsal, which is pointed out there, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about some injuries that occur to that. Um, people have heard of Jones fractures, possibly, and, and avulsion fractures of of the head of the fifth, which are very common injuries that we're going to talk about. So go ahead to the next slide. Will do. Uh, the base of the fifth, uh, which if you took off your shoe and you felt on the outside of your foot, there's, there's down from the malleolus, which is the big bump on the outside of your ankle, and go down to the foot, there's a bump on the outside of everybody's foot. And we see in, in volleyball as well as a lot of other sports, whenever you have a lot of ankle sprains, but especially in your youth, those of you that are dealing with the club uh, and youth volleyball players, watch for this with a lateral ankle sprain. The ankle sprain will seem mild, but they will complain of pain and tenderness and they'll get swelling right over that, that head of that fifth metatarsal, which is what that bump is. And one of these three injuries has occurred. The most common is an avulsion fracture, and you see it's in blue, and that blue part of that head of the fifth. And the muscles that evert your foot, the perineal muscles, for those of you who know anatomy, come down, and um, the, the second and third insert right on that that bone right there. And when you sprain that ankle and you invert it far enough, you put enough stress or tension on them that in, especially when the person's young and the bones are not, are still growing and are more cartilaginous, the tendons are stronger. And so what happens is the tendons pull away and separate that bone. And sometimes pull literally a whole bone piece off but it, they separate it, and that's what we call an avulsion fracture, where the tendon is pulling off the bone or separating it. Um, these people have pain and point tenderness around that and swelling there, and they'll have a mechanism usually for an ankle injury. The Jones fracture, which is in the green part of this head of the fifth, this is a serious injury um, or fracture um, that's going to require surgery. Uh, in your athletes to fix. If you have a fracture in that in that area, usually this is somebody who comes down on somebody else's foot and rolls laterally and the bone is going to kind of arch and get rolled and it cracks right there. Um, and if it occurs in that area, they're going to have to go in and put a screw down it because most of the time, I forget the exact percentage, but it's high. It's like 70% of the time, if you just cast this and or, and or splint it, it'll heal. But what happens is, is it gets a a um, calcification on the outside, but the middle part of the bone never fills in, and so it looks healed on X-ray except for this big hollow point, hollow in the middle. So you have to put a screw in it. Um, most of our competitive athletes at the university level. Um, if you're going to play in competition, you go ahead and put a screw down in it if you have a Jones fracture. Um, but it needs to be identified um, and figure out which one of those it is. Stress fractures in the in the fifth metatarsal occur above that point um, and occur often in jumping athletes. And the reason why it's a little more common, I think, in volleyball players is 
in their jumping is, is oftentimes you're stepping left or stepping right, and so you're not just landing on the ball of your feet all the time. You're hitting over onto that head of that fifth as you're coming down, more so than the ball or the, the stronger part of your foot that's meant to absorb the, the shock. Um, if they do have an avulsion fracture, um, as long as it's not completely torn off or separated, that's usually treated just like a lateral ankle sprain. It's just we know it's going to take four to six weeks for the bone to heal, so it's going to have to be splinted um, and probably in a boot a little bit longer than a normal ankle sprain. If it's a Jones fracture, that's surgical. If it's a stress fracture, they're going to be off of it for a period of time. And if you look in the x-ray to the right, you'll see an avulsion fracture. And then this is an example in this next slide of a actual, there you go. That first slide is, a, is an actual avulsion fracture where the, it's pulled off. Go ahead to the next slide. And this is a Jones fracture where it's actually down in the green. It's not that bony tip on the outside pulled away. It's broken right down in the middle. This needs immediately, immediate referral once it's identified to an orthopedist. It's going to need surgery. Go ahead to the next. The next big one is injuries to the thumb. We see these all the time. Um, the two names for the injury are gamekeeper's thumb. It was, comes from people who dealt with uh, chickens um, when they would grab them and they'd kick around and they would sprain their thumbs. Or skier's thumb. And since a lot of you are out west, you may ski. But if you're wearing your ski strap of your pole and you put your pole down, down and you keep going and pull stage, your thumb gets bent back. That's where those names come from. It's a hyperextension injury with abduction, and you can see this person basically has no uh, <laughs> on their collateral, collateral ligament there in the thumb in that one picture where it's just moving all the way over. Very common with setters when they're trying to set the ball. Um, it can also happen from trying to dig a ball because you hit the floor when you're trying to go pancake or real flat um, and your thumb catches on the surface and, and rolls back. Um, a third degree sprain, a complete rupture of this ligament or an avulsion fracture, and you can see in the x-ray where the ligament pulls bone away, known as bony gamekeepers, are significant injuries. The person's going to know about it. That one they're not going to complain about. The one you got to watch for is when these are in first or second degree sprains, and as a result, the player, it's sore, they want to play on it. But every time that thumb gets tweaked back into that position, so if they're a setter, it's going to happen a lot. If it's a first or second degree, though, um, usually the way we treat these is taping and or splinting and try to get them to wear a uh, splint throughout the day. And then for practice, we'll tape them, allow them to get some reps, but reduce the reps and then progress them and work on hand strengthening with putties and, and uh, racquetballs and other things to get the strength back. But if it's an avulsion fracture or a complete rupture, you're probably going to need surgery. Um, Go ahead to the next. I'm going to Go ahead. Marie mentioned that her uh, daughter um, blew her ACL and tore her meniscus. Um, Okay. Distant state and on the 29th had some surgery. So I just wanted everybody listening in tonight to know that for serious injuries like this or for kids with cancer, um, kids that yeah. have had a bad injury, we've got a compassion post that we send to you free of charge. Um, and if you know of a kid that deserves such a thing, uh, the kid at Baylor that had Hodgkins, uh, as I recall, or something that was pretty yeah. serious. We, she got presented that in front of the crowd at the Baylor game, and we've made these so that around the uh, around the kids' photo that you send us, we put the beach Olympic teams, male and female, the uh, indoor Olympic teams, and the sitting teams, and some other inspirational quotes and things. So. Hopefully, uh, none of you really have to deal with the kind of stuff that Noreen and her daughter is doing with a, you know, an ACL tear that's going to keep her out for quite a while. But we do have these sort of motivational and compassion posters that we'll make up for you and send to you free of charge. 
Um, another thing real quick before you go away from the slide that I forgot to mention. Oh, with, hang on. I'm going with, back. Um, sorry, go back. This injury, a lot of people think oh, it's no big deal, but if think about this. This is your thumb. This is what sets us apart, allows us to oppose. If it's a significant injury, it needs to be treated. Playing on a second or third degree avulsion just because somebody can tape it and the person can push through, while short-term, volleyball is a wonderful sport, etc., long-term activities of daily living of an unstable thumb is significantly and can be significantly debilitating down the road to a career. So oftentimes a skier's thumb or gamekeeper's thumb kind of gets written off as not that big of a deal. But think about the joint that we're talking about. So if it's a significant injury, it needs to be treated and not become chronic in that area. Okay, go on to the next one. Okay, this is another big one that everybody should pay attention to because this is this gets missed. By the way, it is the most commonly misdiagnosed fracture, even by emergency rooms. Somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of emergency rooms will not pick up on this fracture, um, and for good reason once I explain it. It's called a scaphoid or more commonly called a navicular fracture. And if you all take your thumb, just like in the picture of the actual hand there, and if you pull your thumb back with some resistance, two tendons will pop up just like that arrow is sitting between those two tendons on most people. And that spot is called the anatomical snuff box is what we refer to it. And right below it is your scaphoid bone, also called the navicular bone. The mechanism of injury for this is falling on an outstretched hand. Now how often do our volleyball players fall on their hands straight out? Um, the good news is if you've got a pancake where you're straightening your arm out, that's good. But if you land on that hand and wrist straight down onto it, um, and it's the most commonly misdiagnosed fracture. It will be missed on an initial x-ray because it will not show up, and that's why emergency rooms and others. As far as in the orthopedic world, if a person has fallen on an outstretched hand, has significant pain, and is point tender over that anatomical snuff box, um, then we treat it as if it is a scaphoid or navicular fracture until proven otherwise. And what that means is, is we're going to put it in a splint and immobilize it um, for the first three to five days and then take a follow-up x-ray. Now, why is that significant? This is why it's significant. A lot of people blow it off, and, and it's not uncommon. We've seen a couple of these at the volleyball festival. Somebody comes in with chronic nagging wrist pain that's been going on for a few weeks that happened at another tournament, and they're point tender over that spot. We take the x-ray, and sure enough, they have a scaphoid fracture. And what happens is, is if this is not splinted and immobilized right away, then the bone, the navicular bone, because of where it breaks, loses blood supply to half of it, and the other half of the bone dies. And the way that this is fixed is surgically, and they have to take a bone graft, usually from the iliac, from the hip, and they bone graft into that. And so while the problem with this injury is, is that the person's going to fall on it, hit their hand, it's going to hurt. They're going to be able to play, they're going to be able to hit, it, and the most common way people describe it is, is a nagging wrist sprain or soreness in the wrist that just won't go away. Um, go ahead to the next slide because I think I put images of it. Did you get the, there you go. So if it's a scaphoid fracture, uh, non-union, if not detected early, it's going to need surgical repair. But Early treatment is to splint that um, and then take an x-ray because they have, have a high, ind high index of suspicion if they're point tender over the navicular and have the mechanism. And we splint them um, in a thumb spike or thumb spike a cast for the first three to five days. And they do make some now removable um, spike of splints that we'll put them in and then we'll x-ray it. because. If the fracture line will show up around five to six days post-injury, 
and if you got it slinted, it will heal in most of the cases. Still, there's, there's instances where it doesn't, and you still need to have the surgery, but it gives them the best thing. And it's one that will get missed a lot. Go ahead to the next slide. And the player usually doesn't even notice it until the next day. And these are actual images. Um, the, the top image on the top left is a CT with, uh, with contrast, and you can see the line there. Um, the one on the right, uh, which is a regular x-ray, the top right of the slide, there's a, there's a faint black line that looks like a Y shape going through it. Now this person also happens to have a fracture of their uh, of their ulna as well, which clues you into the other. But these are very faint cracks. Every one of these images um, is uh, at least three to four days old. In other words, the initial images of these particular injuries, it didn't show up when it initially happened. Although the one on the right, their uh, top right, her wrist swelled up because of that other fracture. Next one is mallet finger. Um, I mentioned this, it's usually, you see it a lot in basketball and others, but I've seen it in volleyball. Um, it's usually when you hit the end of your fingertip against something hard, whether it's a ball coming at you, you see this in some setters, and we see it in back row people going down into the floor to try to pancake or dig, and they hit their tip of their finger. The top picture is a picture of an actual mallet finger. Literally, the tip of their finger bends down because they can't extend it. And the reason they can't extend it is they've either ruptured the extensor tendon, which the little finger right off of that shows a tendon rupture, or the x-ray below it shows they've evolved the bone off um, that that tendon would attach to, and so it stays dropped down. The biggest thing that has to be done with these is they have to be splinted in, in extension, and it has to stay in extension. This is not something you can keep moving the splint on and off. Every time you pull the splint off and they flex, you have to restart the whole process. Oh, so, uh, yeah, it, it will, it's got to be splinted. And this one for a volleyball player is a problem, uh, especially if they're an outside hitter or a hitter and it's on their hitting hand or middle blocker because they're going to have a splint on that and that becomes problematic. Uh, you know, I, uh, so. I broke only one bone in my life. I've skied and done a lot of different sports, and that was the tip of my thumb blocking a um, national team player named Rod Wild. And I thought I'd jam my thumb, and I was kind of rubbing things out, and then I'd get up to the tip of my thumb, and I'd go, ooh. But I played for about a week, and then I finally said, this isn't getting any better, and they x-rayed it. And that little tiny bone that you you know, would yep. snap right in half. No ligament damage, just the bone would, uh, would snap. And again, the, the the lesson there is, and I hear it all the time, well, if it was broken, I couldn't play on it or I couldn't do it. You can play, and the human body is pretty amazing, what you can do, and you can, I've seen a lot of athletes do a lot of amazing things with broken bones. The bottom line um, in preventing a lot of, volleyball injuries is first realize that with any with any sports injuries are going to happen but listen to your athletes if they're hurt then get it evaluated modify their training rest it find out what's going on what's causing it that person's had this low back pain and it's chronic and you know maybe it does need further evaluation by somebody check for those spondies spondylolithesis is this you know, and I, I get there's always the balance of you have, if you're dealing with really young um, club players that maybe it's their first time out to a sport and, and what's really pain and what's not. But again, um, you have to listen to them to some extent. Proper conditioning and training um, to individualize those workouts. In other words, identify the muscle imbalances. One of the biggest things the American uh, Orthopedic Sports Medicine Society, the AOSSM, and their STOP program is emphasizing is, is the multi-sport helps cross-train, if they play more than one sport, cross-train the muscle groups. But if you're not going to do that, 
then you've got to look at a holistic conditioning program and identify any muscle imbalances that are going to be created potentially by the sport activity and counteract them in the conditioning, requiring sometimes even more individualized conditioning as a result. Um, instruct and enforce mastery of technique. Again, repetitive hitting, to have hitting drills, if the person is not doing correct form, maybe you want them to hit 50, 50 hits or do 25 or 30 sets, but if they're not getting their body into the position you guys know as coaches is the best position, after 25 they need to stop because that fatigue factor is going to lead to injury if they do it incorrectly. So emphasis on that quality versus quantity and eventually get to the quantity. I'm not saying they shouldn't forever, but you got to build them there and build in, build their tolerance up to that. And that's going to be different for each player and depending on the experience. And then a balanced approach or cross training. Take some time to do some other things. I mean, you, you got the players together there. What are you going to do to cross train and have, have a little fun? There's lots of different ways to cross train some activities, but uh, mix it up a little bit. Well, Eric, that's... Uh I haven't seen that many x-rays in a long while. <laughs> but yeah. We and do have in here and athletes don't want to see that. <laughs> we do have some great questions. Dan's okay. got the most general one that I think so we'll start with that. Um what's the best way to warm up your shoulder before you play? <laughs> best way to warm up your shoulder. Um this question gets asked all the time. Well, the first is, is, is activity in general is going to warm it up better. I see a lot of athletes wanting to put heat packs and other things like that on the shoulder. And um, being somebody who teaches actual, I teach modalities, um, I can tell you the heat pack's not going to do any good in warming that shoulder up. But what will is activity, getting your metabolism up, um, riding a bike, arming a bike. Um, but stretching your shoulder is good um, before, but remember work on the posterior capsule, not just the front. Um, but beyond that, going out and doing some regular jogging activities and things like that, I know that sounds a little cliche or a little general, but um, that's, that's really what, what you should be doing. All right, well, then that leads us to Laura's a little bit more specific question, which was, okay. um, how does she say it? Let's see. Where can you find really good, correct shoulder exercises to focus on the posterior activity? <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a good question, and I do have some resources I can send to, to John. Um, on that, and I, I'm pretty sure the AOSSM, if you look up STOP, which is uh, their STOP program, if you go online and look it up, it has, for a lot of sports, uh, a lot of different injury prevention. I think they have some of that. It's uh, Dr. Andrews is, is the one who's behind all of that, and of course, is one of the leading shoulder experts out there. Um, but there are a lot of programs. Ironically, I, I I'll have to go and look for you, John, and see what's in the volleyball literature about it. I know there's a lot in the baseball literature about the posterior stretching exercises. But I'll send you some things that you can send to them. Is That'll that be right? great. That would be fantastic. I know. Okay. I, some, uh, so Wes, out of Virginia Beach, um, points out something that we should mention here, and that is uh -huh. uh, concussions. And, oh. you know, obviously... At one end, Eric, you know, you can't do brain exercises and <laughs> variations on a thing <laughs> to prevent. But do know, everyone, that the last two years of impact has a great deal of concussion information. And uh, with the Center for Disease, Disease Control, we have a... Disease Control. We have a clipboard right. sticker that has USA Volleyball's logo, and it has signs of concussion. And there is an entire section of the grassroots pull-down bar where free webinars is in the Fs. Well, above that, under the Cs, is concussion information to right. give you 
uh, one-stop shopping tools to how we at USA Volleyball are dealing with the concussion. Um, I I met with Mayo Clinic uh, two weeks ago, and we're going to be getting every high-performance player in our training program uh, baseline concussion tests and free uh, post-concussion tests. And there's they're going to be working with the whole region of Arizona to provide that free of charge and we're you know kind of in a phase out mode trying to see how do we get affordable baseline concussion testing for everybody and you know there's just a lot of right. stuff going on it's probably its own webinar to be honest I, <laughs> it it probably is and and I could give you some great recommendations and some great speakers for that but let me add in one thing here I would I would strongly encouraged with with concussion stuff too is there's been a lot of states recently passing different concussion legislations and for those of you who are youth sport coaches etc in some states and Arizona I do believe is one of them and in several others their their concussion laws are not just for um, that have passed are not just about high school sports. Some of them, the new rules and regulations of the state by law uh, are going to force you to comply as a youth sport uh, coach or entity. So, yeah. uh -huh. um, so, and that's going to be state to state and then in each state, but the the newer concussion laws, and I, and I know Arizona does, does have youth sport and I think Oregon is one of the others. Um, right now, we're involved in. I'm the president of the Kentucky Athletic Training Society, and or right now in this legislative session, there's concussion legislation being looked at. And one of the things is to add youth sports. So um, be aware of that. And, and the other knowledge for you, you that are doing club and you travel, if it is a state law, just because in your state you don't have to comply with it. If you travel to a club tournament in another state and it's now state law, you will have to comply with that state's laws and regulations regarding youth sport. So keep that in mind as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great probably observation. the other, other part to be aware of. Yeah, that's a great observation because when you go into Florida, your emergency release form has to be notarized. Mm -hmm. And that's not, a, that's not normal for most states. Um, everybody, I'm going to just show you this, good luck uh, from all the teams that won medals in Beijing and the awareness that the educational webinar could be a uh, module if you want and you contact uh, Diana Cole and the people at CAP and we are going to archive this. So we're going to get some other questions going but if you've got to get on, uh, you don't want to listen to the questions that are coming up on an ACL question and I'm going to read Clifford's next about vegetarians and stress fractures please know that you can sign off and and you can listen to this stuff later on if you want to get on with family life but uh, that said if you can hang in there a little bit more Eric we've got a few more questions yeah, that are kind of cool fine. all right um, Clifford asks uh, talking about the female triad has Eric dealt with any athletes that are vegetarians I know that Bill Walton from UCLA was a vegetarian had severe problems with stress fractures with his ankles in his pro career. Yeah, um, and the, the, of course there's different levels of vegetarian. Are you dealing with uh, a true vegan, um, which isn't going to even take, you know, eggs or fish or others? Um, we have now, um, I have the luxury of, we have a dietetics program here at EKU, and so while we're a smaller school and not in Alabama or Florida, which I, nutrition is becoming a big deal. Let me first say that. You'll see more and more of your major colleges have full-time staff sports nutritionists, and of course we have, through our dietetics program, a, a nutritionist that we can refer our athletes to to, to figure out what's going on. Um, I think there's there's two things is is how long have they been uh, a vegetarian you know is it lifelong is it their parents brought them up that way a lot of times I think where you have the bigger bigger problems is is the the younger uh, female athlete who oftentimes decides to switch to that maybe in junior high early high school and so 
they don't even know necessarily how to eat, you know, for themselves to keep their regular nutrition up. Um, but we've had we've had uh, vegetarians, and in my I've been lucky enough that they haven't really had major stress fracture issues, et cetera, that I've had to deal with. But again, it goes back to that female triad a little bit. But another factor when you're looking at these youth um, in the club scene is, is when did they start this process, um, and what are they what are they doing uh, nutrition wise? And lastly, if you know somebody is a vegetarian and you've got them, and, and even if they've been since their parents brought them up that way or they've decided since they were young, when you're going to club tournaments and stuff, think about that when you're planning meals, snacks, and other things because that's when I think some of them run into problems um, is, you know, are you ordering or making sure you're at a place where you can get them a proper diet uh, for that. But it can be an issue, um, oftentimes it depends on when they started. We did have, I will say this, I've dealt, we had a women's soccer player that I have dealt with uh, that did have stress fracture issues, but she also decided to become a vegetarian her senior year of high school and then came to Division One college to play soccer um, and really hadn't figured out how to balance her diet out. So yeah. I've seen it. All right. Hannah um, asks what? a cool question um, that Okay. More than a few people have probably had a process. My daughter had ACL injury in April and is now playing. Her ortho said a brace while playing is not necessary. What's your view, Eric? Um, yeah, that's pretty uh, standard nowadays that the brace is not necessary while they're while they're playing. Um, the key is is whoever you're working with, whoever her therapist was rehab is, are they back? to good, um, again, it goes, goes back to is their strength in their core and their other back uh, to good levels. Um, and again, we have athletes all the time that return without brace um, to play all different sports. Um, and then you get into the other X factors. Um, was it just ACL? Did she also have meniscal injury? Um, then you talk about the type of repair it was. I mean, those are all factors, but the biggest key to returning them to play and, and getting them brace free is making sure the you have good muscle balance across all and good proprioceptive uh, strength across all. And here's probably the one key that I tell every athlete returning back is just because you're back to play doesn't mean you stop your rehab, especially in that first year back. We here keep our athletes continuing through strengthening and training and stuff like all the rehab stuff plus their regular probably for another year or so um, just because we want to make sure they get those, those right balances back. I'm not saying that's the key to all of it. Um, uh, how old was their daughter? Uh, you know, that, that, Hannah, roughly. if you'll respond, I can, I can tell you okay. this. If Eric, Hannah you heard know. me, I because I, I want to make I want to mention something here. Having worked at, I used to work with gymnasts a lot and in gymnastics, um, at, at a at a gymnastics club that has younger uh, athletes, you know, that are having ACLs that are you know they're. 10, 11, 12 years of age, and they usually have a semi-tendinosis graft because of the immature knee. And the younger they are, the better they tend to come back and heal and, and stays nice and tight, ironically. So well, uh, Hannah says tight. 15 with surgery, now 16. 16, okay. Yeah. Um, the, the big key, I'm not Again, I'm not against not having him in the brace. Um, most of our ACLs will go back without brace. Um, it's just good quality rehab and, and staying on that training. Well, I can tell you, Eric doesn't know this, but in 1973, before they did anything to ACLs, I blew mine. <laughs> so they removed it, oh. and they removed some meniscus, and now... <laughs> 
40 years later, I have played symptom-free without a brace, and, you know, I don't even have my ACL, and I still play in the father-daughter tournaments and stuff. So that leads us to a question from Laura, who, or no, from uh, Noreen. Um, what's a good video or workout regime to help prevent ACL injuries in women's volleyball players? Is that possible? Wow. Um, the, the That's always the, the big question. Um, that's a great question. I don't know that it's been developed specific for volleyball. Probably the best overall uh, women's ACL prevention program that I'm aware of that's been been somewhat validated in all of it is from Cincinnati Sports Medicine um, and they have videos and conditioning and things like that and uh, John I can send you the link to their information I mean it is a it is a program that, that people can purchase and coaches can purchase um, but it's probably the only one that I know and they've been doing ongoing research on prevention of ACL injuries in women but it it's a, just across the board I don't know of any volleyball specific, unless you know of something, John, that okay. I'm not aware That's of. That's a good one. I think that if you can do that, that would be great. She says thanks on that for sure. Um, Nelson's got a Nelson's got a really specific one. So there, there was one about foam okay. roller. Is that in here? it's still in here? So we'll ask Nelson. Okay. I T band injury. I had acupuncture oh, okay. done, uh, band stretched for four weeks. And said seems to help about twice a day, and I've just started using a foam roller. Is there anything else I can do? And and I can say that my house went from no foam rollers to about three in the space of a year. <laughs> yeah, um, on your own, those sound like probably the the best options you have. Uh, Iontophoresis, your therapist may have tried um, that, um, which is putting medication in through use of the electrical stem or maybe you've tried a patch. Um, and then the only other thing that I know um, works fairly well with IT band that people have had it done, but again, you'd be needing to see if your therapist has the capability or strained or somebody has grasped in techniques. Um, but that's about and then it's that constant stretching and and the uh, foam rollers. I know our track athletes who deal with a lot love the foam rollers. Um, and then we'll do manual massage um, over it. And then uh, they don't, they probably don't want that if we need to. Right. No, no, they don't. They don't like the actual massage over that part of it. No, but <laughs> it, it's it's effective. It's the part that they like. All right. Well, Laura's left had a question about lower mid back, so okay. I'll send you her information. Maybe you can respond to that. But the uh, okay, the last one's kind of a generic one that, is, as I said about Jill Gerber, said is it better to develop time, um, uh, more time at young I... ages to athletic development than competing? And I'll give you my take on it, and then we'll let Eric kind of close out tonight. And and my take. Okay. Kids love to compete and play, and, you know, that's why there are thousands of tag games, and we play King of the Hill, and we have bicycle races, and we do all these things. So I don't see them even close to mutually, uh, you know, they're, they're the same thing in my book where playing a tag game is getting athletic development while you're also having a heck of a lot of fun competing, you know, <laughs> and, and my kids, uh, as I said, my son's at Princeton playing volleyball now, my daughter's going to another great school called Bowdoin, um, they're skiers, tennis players, volleyball players, lacrosse players, they weren't just volleyball players, but they have a passion to play volleyball, and the way you get best at volleyball, Misty May and Karch Karai, the best player in the first hundred years, followed this path. That was to play doubles rather than sixes as they were young and growing up until they hit about 13 or 14. 
and then they started to specialize some. So that's, I think you can do both, uh, Jill, really. Oh, she's saying, I meant in terms of playing in tournaments. Sorry, so, Eric, I'll let you finish it up. Wait, read, read that question again. Read the first part of the question. So she again. says, is it better to spend more time at younger ages to athletic development than competing in tournaments? Uh, well, um, I, I think at the younger ages, if I think I think both is good because the the problem is is they've got to develop um, game awareness, situational awareness. The tournaments aren't bad if the coach and the others, and this is a hard one, can keep things in perspective and aren't pushing them to do stuff beyond, you know, like the 11 and 12 year olds, or the 12 year olds competing at, at the volleyball festival. You don't see a lot of them doing jump serving. You don't see a lot of them doing a lot of hitting. There's a lot of bump pass type things that's keeping you in perspective, but it's still teaching them um, some skills that, that are necessary. And our 12 year old and 13 year olds um, don't play as many uh, matches as the upper level in, in our tournament. So if it's done right, I think, it, I think it's okay for them to compete because they've, they've got to learn um, those game skills and those game situations. But as far as the overall conditioning, you, you need to, uh, they still do need to work on the sport, sport specific Stuff hey, Eric, this has been um, awesome. What? Wait, let me... Let me no, you thing. can't go. You've gone okay. over time. <laughs> Continue. <Okay. laughs> All right. Well, uh, sports metrics, um, which is a combination of sports metrics and the Cincinnati Sports Medicine. If somebody looks up sports metrics ACL injury prevention program, the person who's looking for it, um, they have a whole comprehensive program, both videos as well as you can find somebody who's certified and trained in your area if there is one near you. Um, but again, it's probably the, the only one that I'm, I'm aware of. So, um, Well, fantastic information. Uh, I appreciate your willingness to share this on behalf of all the athletes, parents, and kids, and coaches, and directors, and volleyball. So no um, have a great holiday. Thank you for having holiday. me. <clears throat> all right. And we'll be uh, in touch when we uh, see you at the festival again. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. All right, Eric, and happy and, holidays to everybody. And if you need some names for a concussion one or one a shoulder expert, just let me know. Will do. Okay. Thanks All so right. much. Bye. Bye.